That's right. And you start your work after we've already started our class. It's not bad. Everyone has a commentary. We need to okay. study. Well, you can get it for $9.57. What a bargain. What a bargain. All right. You've talked me into it. $9. $9. What a bargain. Okay. Are we ready to start? Everybody take a deep breath. I probably have told you before, uh, because, you know, I was in a classic Misnagdish yeshiva. Misnagidish Meshiva, which means people who didn't study any Hasidic thought, or definitely Kabbalah, because Kabbalah was always, um, you know, you got, they would say certain claims of, most people would always say, you have to be 40 or over, married with kids, um, to study it, uh, or you have to really know all of uh, Shas and Poskim. Shas and Poskim, which means you have to know the entire Talmud, and all of the codifiers of the Jewish laws, and then you could go ahead and study. So I was, uh, I remember when I first came to the yeshiva, I w- well, I somehow got hit earlier. My dad, I guess he had a, a Gershom Shalom book on his shelf, mm-hmm. right? And uh, I got hit with that, and it was like mystical, and it was about Moshe, and it was like, whoa. So I knew something about it, and I knew something about it being Jewish, and... So um, I uh, was intrigued, of course, as soon as they got me into the yeshiva, they brought me into a Kabbalah class. It was an instructor there. He was great. He was dynamic. But that he, they, they quickly squelched that and kind of scooted him out of the yeshiva, escorted him out, and they put me into Talmud, and they say, this is what you need to learn. Like after the first couple of months I was in the yeshiva, Talmud. I'm like, Talmud is boring. Right? So, right? But no, so you have to do this. So I did it, and I stuck with it, and Baruch Hashem, I'm very happy that they, that they pushed me into that boot camp. It was a boot camp, okay? Talmud boot camp. You've got to learn how to learn. And it was great. And it's very important. The most important of all. You have to know how to learn, okay? So, um, but of course, after eight years, suddenly I got woken up. A friend of my father's woke me up and says, why can't they? I went to a guy, I wanted him to teach me Kabbalah, but he said, like, he can't teach me any Kabbalah because I don't know anything, right? And, and all of a sudden, I got woken up. I'm like, oh, no, I got I, you're right. I whole came to the yeshiva. I wanted to study this. And they, they what do you call it? Def, deflayed me, def, detracted me. They got me on this. So I somehow met somebody, and, and I says, you know, you study. I know that you... I heard you have some classes, or you go somewhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come to my, our place, 8 o'clock, in, in, in the old city, the certain place. So I had to escape the yeshiva. <laughs> I had to run out of the yeshiva, duck out, and I went to this class, and he taught this stuff. My first, very, very, her first real introduction to real Kabbalah was this set of books here by Rabbi Yehuda Leib Ashlag, okay, who was a rab basically before, in Poland before the war, he saw what was going down. He said, Poland is on fire. He told his community, get out, everybody. Get out before it's too late. He got out, of course, but nobody else, or, you know, I know very few people did. And he went to Israel. He was a rab in Yushalayim. He was the first uh, rabbi who uh, translated the Zohar from Aramaic to Hebrew, because otherwise nobody really knew the Aramaic. So he took it and gave a, and a, and a commentary of it, the very first. And, um, and he was known as, as the Sulam. The, the commentary was, uh, of, this, of, the, um, of the Zohar was called the Sulam, the ladder. means the ladder. So he was always called, referred to as the Sulam, the ladder. And his wisdom is the wisdom of the ladder. So here... Nobody ever translated, and, and he made introductions to all of his books that he wrote on. He commentary on the Zohar, he wrote an introduction to that. He made his own Talmud of Ten Sfirot, a Talmud, like a set of books, explaining the whole map of the, of the spiritual realms. And he wrote an introduction to that, and he wrote many other works, and he wrote introductions. So somebody put together all of his introductions, and that's why the name of this book was called Sefer Hakdamot which means the book of introductions. So they took all of his introductions and put it into a set of books, and this is what I would sneak out of yeshiva. They're going to get after me right now, you understand? <laughs> Anybody hears this? What are you talking about, man? What were you doing there? So I would sneak out, and I told, like I said, when I first 
bought this book, I'm telling you, I was like flying. I wasn't even touching the ground. I was so happy. <laughs> and, and I wanted to put on Shabbos clothes. There's a thing about putting on Shabbos clothes when you get a very special safer because it's like a very special moment. So my first introduction was this, okay? And this book, oh, a book of introductions, starts with the very first introduction, which is called uh, Hakadama Le Talmud Eser Svirot, which means the introduction to the Talmud, which will, you call the Talmud, I guess, the learning or the study of the Ten Svirot. Now, this book here, uh, he, also, he, he only translated two introductions, okay? And he started with the introduction to the Zohar, and then the second was the introduction to the Ten Svirot. So I liked the, first, the second one because I felt it was important to cut to the chase. And since I've, then I saw it in the, in the Hebrew, and that was the first one that they put in the book, so that's what we're going to start with, okay? I did have a debate about which introduction oh, yeah. to start with, but we're going to start with introduction number two because it's juicy, okay? <laughs> They're all both juicy. It's all juicy. The, you know, the greatest thing that, I, that he did... Now, I have to just go to step two. In this school, Kol Yehuda, I think that's what the name of it, this yeshiva was. You have to go into the old city, these old streets, and you go up the stairs, and there's a little place, there's a room there, and that's where they would study this stuff. And then they would have Rabbi Brandwine would teach in Hebrew, and then they had Rabbi Graf was teaching in English. And... You know, once people came out with introductions, Rabbi Berg. Is anybody familiar with the Kabbalah Center? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -oh. I'm not going to talk much about it, okay? Don't. Because people always say, it's a treif, yeah. stay away. You know, I say like an Italian accent, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not kosher Torah. Rabbi Berg and the, and the Kabbalah Center is not kosher Torah. Rabbi Berg went to the exact same place that I went to. He was years before me went and studied this stuff, gleaned it all, took it, and, of course, to America and exploited it and became the Kabbalah Center. His source was, is this material. So if you'll go to a rabbi, certain I know my, there's a rabbi here in Houston who went to this rabbi, there's a certain Kabbalist, and he says, can I learn this stuff? And they go, no. And I'm like, dude, no way. This is the root of it. You don't... Yeah. So you don't go to the Kabbalah Center, you know, you, but you, to get where, where they got it from, it's dynamic. Because once you get the rules in here, you can see all of reality in, as in a different way. That's what the whole purpose of the study of Kabbalah is, okay? To see everything different, okay? So, uh, so but do they still exist? They used to be Kabbalah Center. I think they moved they, from over there by Shepherd Street into. Uh, they're all over. They do a lot of their There's stuff. There's a in, um, more richer neighborhood. I went there. Okay? Well, I didn't like it. <laughs> no, they do a lot of their things in the Marriott. They, no. like I say, so they don't. Listen, have I give credit where credit to do. I, I give the benefit of the doubt. No other rabbi, Orthodox rabbi, will probably give them any kind of stamp of kosher whatsoever. But you have to look for what is good. And that's my oh. always my objective. If they do bring Jews closer to Judaism to some degree, that's a plus. In other words, if you can awaken a Jew to saying, wow, there's a lot of mystic tradition in your culture, in, your, in, in Judaism, and a person can awaken, that's a beautiful thing. The problem is they just, they don't, there's a, there's a dilemma in, amongst the outreach world. How much can you push people? Right? Mm -hmm. How far can you push a person? Right? So they only wanted to push this way, this much. Like, buy the red string, buy the water, scan your text, good to go. Right? We don't say that. <laughs> you know, we don't go like, this is the level. You, 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 you know, Madonna's, Madonna's going to handle the red string and maybe a bottle of water she'll pay $10,000 yeah. for. <laughs> and then, good to go. Right? We, no, we are always constantly pushing and we never, we always strive for more and more and more. And scanning basically is not a kosher thing, okay? It might be helpful to look at pretty, uh, pretty Hebrew letters. I think that's a wonderful thing, better than looking at some of the other junk that people look at. Okay, why not? But that's not going to be all of your mystical experience, scanning pages of Zohar, which is what they basically promote to do. Sorry to put that to be a little detracting before we get into the meat and potatoes, but you have to understand I was always told to stay away from Rabbi Berg, and I still have to this day. But I do say it's a wonderful thing that they did promote Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism in a way that brings a lot of people closer. So I give 
because I know uh, there was a people in Mexico, they came in to the Kabbalah Center in Mexico City, and it was very inspiring for them. Of course, what happened is they wanted more. So then they broke off and made their own shul, and now they're very observant Jews. That is a tremendous merit. That's a tremendous merit. You have to give a merit where a merit is due. Okay? So... Without further ado, okay, mats, okay, Boresh Milim, in the very beginning of the words, Matsati li sorch gadol le potzeitz mechitzas barzel. I needed to open up, I need to break through the, how do you call it, the iron curtain, okay? Some kind of iron curtain, right? Let me just get it in English here. Um, thank you. Just want to make sure we're all on the same. At the beginning of this discourse, I discover a great need within myself to shatter an iron curtain which separates us from the wisdom of the Kabbalah since the time of the destruction of the temple right up to our own generation. As we know, maybe now, maybe it's less now. All I know is in my day, if I was caught learning a Kabbalah Sefer, it would be oisvarf. That's a Yiddish word meaning like you get kicked out of the yeshiva or you have to talk with the Rosh Yeshiva and he's going to blast you, right? It's, gonna, it's not good. You cannot learn this, okay? He wants to break open those doors, okay? And that's really what he did. This is what he really innovated, okay? Him and after him was Rabbi Kaplan, uh, Rabbi Arya Kaplan, who, who translated a lot of texts in, from he, the Hebrew that were unaccessible to American or English speakers, and now he made it accessible. And it's very mystical, it's very in, prominent that the fact that the Kabbal- Kabbalistic wisdom is now coming out more than ever uh, because we're getting closer to the days of Mashiach, okay, as it's known. This barrier has burdened us to a very serious degree and awakens the fear that the Kabbalah might even be forgotten in Israel, God forbid, Okay. So you can't have this esoteric wisdom to be forgotten, and therefore he is very pressed to come out with the needs that basically he's going to say and bring reasons why people have to study Kabbalah. Okay? When I begin to advise someone concerning the study of this subject, their first question is, but why do I need to know how many angels there are in heaven and what names they and what their names are? Okay? Surely can I keep the whole of the Torah in all its fullest details without this type of knowledge? Has ever this ever entered in anybody's mind? Right? I guess we haven't gotten in enough into the angels and the lists of all the angels that you need to know. You know, Rabbi Nachman says in his second, uh, what do you call it? Opus, opius Maximus? What do you call that? Opus Dei. Opus, opus Maximus. No. no, what's no. this? Opus Magnus. I, Come on, opus you're magnus. supposed to help oh me, doctor. <laughs> opus <laughs> Magnus. <laughs> called Lakute Maran, Collections of the Teaching of Rabbi Nachman. He brings down this amazing thing. I know it's hard for us to digest, but you always got to keep it in mind. The goal of an Israeli is to, be, is to become the boss over all of the angels. Your lifetime goal is to be the CEO of this corporation. But I'm a mailman in the basement. <laughs> you have to become the CEO. You have to be be the boss and telling the angels what to do. Mm-hmm. That's your goal. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? It's an unbelievable thing. Right? And if you don't know their names, they ain't going to do jack for you. Okay? You got to know their names. Okay? I can't even know certain names when I walk through in, in, in a synagogue. Right? I'm going to know these. But this question <laughs> is, why do I need to know about angels and worlds? Let me just practice on what I need to do here in my my Daladamos, we'll I'll call it. Daladamos, which means basically my six feet sphere of influence. Six feet by six feet, okay? That's one question. Why do I need to know all that stuff? Their second question is, didn't the sages already decide that before studying Kabbalah, a person must fill his belly with Talmud and Jewish law? And who can possibly fool himself into thinking that he has already completed the entire revealed Torah? All that he lacks is the concealed Torah of the Kabbalah, right? In other words, no way. To know the entire Talmud and the codifiers, you got to have one of them photographic memories, absorb it all, spend all day with it, be born religious, really, and then still, now, there are people who do that, and they do study the Kabbalah, but they won't tell you that they do. <laughs> Those are the Ashkenaz rabbis. They do it in secret. They don't share with you. They don't tell you. Only very, very occasionally, the something might slip out. 
But in all those Ashkenaz yeshivas, right, in Israel and abroad, and even here, even though they might study, they won't let you know, okay? Thirdly, so that's the first person, is the first, first idea is that, and it's always pushed, is you have to know all of the other Torah, the revealed Torah, before you can study the hidden Torah. Question number three. Thirdly, a person is afraid that he or me should go off the path as a consequence of this study. Now, the interesting thing is that he kind of uh, makes it very, <laughs> he makes it very, um, he, his translation is very parv. The actual Hebrew says, shelo yachmitz chas v'shalom. Machmas ha'esek is Yachmitz is chomet. Do you know what chomets is? Yachmitz vinegarize. His brain will become vinegar. Oh. Meaning he'll go crazy. Because people who study Kabbalah go crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay? I've seen that. I don't know why he went crazy. It could be that he came crazy. <laughs> he came to the yeshiva crazy. I will tell you people who would just spin. Okay? And we don't know if it's because of the Kabbalah, or maybe they were crazy before and on meds, and they stopped taking their meds when they got to the yeshiva. Most you remember that movie, no, Fanny and Alexander, by Bergman, that day, four, three, <laughs> well, that's because you're young. Yes, Kabbalah, he was totally nuts, a Jewish person, but he was the one who did the good thing there in that movie. Who's this? What's this? That movie, F Fanny and Alexander. I never oh, saw that was it. By Bergman. That's, yeah, that's an old Bergman film. Yeah, yeah. that's the, the guy there. Go watch, go get Pi. Go watch Pi, and then we can talk. I'm trying to get him to watch yeah. Seventh Seal okay. by Bergman. Okay. All right, the idea of the Hebrew is... A person, if he studies the Kabbalah, he's afraid it's going to make him crazy. Basically, yachmitz, his brain will turn to vinegar, okay? Because he'll start to deal with this. Because it led people astray from the Torah. Because of these would study Kabbalah. The biggest issue that came out was the issue of Shabtai Tzvi. Shabtai Tzvi, I think it was in the 1700s, I believe, who basically announced himself as being the Messiah. He knew some of the Kabbalistic arts, very charismatic, uplifting the depressed community of Europe, led a huge group uh, to try to go to Israel and take over and start the Messianic era. Of course, the ship deflected because of a storm and ended up in Istanbul where the sultan basically threatened him on death. You either convert to Islam or we kill you. And, of course, he went, wala, 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 wala. <laughs> Right? So he, and the entire community was completely shaken, and they blamed Kabbalah for it. Because it led, because he used Kabbalistic arts with, and, his method, and his charismatic methods, methods of persuasion to lead people to think that he was the Messiah. And that just deflated completely the already depressed community. Can you imagine such a thing? Okay? So, people are, are scared. People are scared. Okay? So what do I need this kind of uh, threat for? This kind of pain? How does he translate it? I'm on the next page. Sorry about the bad, uh, you know, that's the photocopy machine, a torch. Anybody want to donate a million dollars for a new photocopy? Okay. <laughs> Therefore, the person says, why should I risk it? Why should I be so foolish to place myself in danger for no good reason? Okay? Fourthly, even those who love this learning only permit it to very saintly people who serve God and not everyone who wants to take it up may do so. In other words, I remember myself going and talking with somebody in the yeshiva about a book called Nefesh HaChayim. Nefesh HaChayim was written by Rabbi Chaim Velashin, who was a student of the Vilna Gon. And that book is like, it kind of like dances on the fence of Kabbalistic wisdom. Philosophy, we've, we've learned it a little bit, dabbed a little bit in it, right? And the guy completely, he spent an hour telling me, yeah, those are for people with certain kind of problems. You don't really <laughs> need it. If you have certain kind of problems, then you go into those kind of books. Otherwise, you don't need to go into those books, right? Deflected me completely, right? The fifth objection that the person may raise is the main one. Okay, there is a halachic principle that states that where there is a case of doubt that's in the community, we look at the general common practice of what the people do. Puk, chazi, mala, ama, ose, go out and see what the people do. Let me get the language here. Asher puk, chazi, mai, ama, devar. What does the people do? Right? In other words, 
should I go, should I study this? But I, what does the general populace of Judaism do? Because usually when you're in a case of doubt, that's what you'll see, what everybody does, right? There are actually amazing uh, halachic ramifications, which is what we do. It is used, this kind of technique. Actually, they would ask Hillel. They had a problem of the sheep for Passover. They needed to slaughter the sheep on Passover, but Passover, heir of Passover, came on Shabbos. And we need to bring the sheep to the temple, and we need to bring also a knife to slaughter it. We're not allowed to carry. What do we do? They asked Hillel. He says, go see what the people are doing. They were putting it inside the sheep wool, and then the sheep would walk with the knife, and then they would take that sheep when they would got to the temple to do the slaughtering of the sheep for the Passover offering. That's the halacha. Okay? Look what the people are doing. They're very Jewish people happen to be. They're very smart. They're very smart. They can figure out things. Right? So that's the... We look at what to do. How does the general populace of the Torah world, what are they engaged in? Daf Yomi. Okay? So... <laughs> A very valuable thing. It does has a certain major good properties. I will admit, you have to look at the good. We always look at the good. So they say, what, right? What is the general common practice? The person tells me, when I look at the people who practice Torah in this generation, I see they have all unanimously abandoned the study of this hidden wisdom. They even counsel, they give advice to those who ask them that without any doubt it is better to spend one time studying a page of Talmud than to occupy himself with Kabbalah. And they'll tell you that. If you go right now, if I take you on a tour to certain com uh, communities, which will remain nameless, they will say, better to study Talmud. You gotta study. It's better to study a page of Talmud than study that. It's not for you. It's not for you. It's not for you. You'll be in, this, in your sleep and hearing it. Not for you, right? So, <laughs> right? So, really, I'm going to tell you, just cut to the chase. Not to, the, not to this chase, but just, a, just another little move, which I don't even know how you can even answer this, but I have many Kabbalists from different places that I've been in who say studying for one hour of Kabbalistic wisdom of the real text, the real deal, is equal to... 30 days of learning Talmud. And I think Rabbi Baruch said, like Rabbi, Bar, uh, uh, Rabbi Bart Sadok said, one year of learning Talmud. Okay? And there was, one guy told a story. He was, uh, you know, a very faint old man. He studied only Talmud, with Talmudic wisdom his whole life and anything like that. And, you know, a very learned man, very scholarly gentleman. But he was old. He was so old he couldn't study himself. But they brought him to a base midrash, a place where people would learn and he would listen. So they brought him to a place where these people were learning the mystical arts, the, the Kabbalah, right? And, you know, whatever he was grasping, he was grasping, and then he passed away, and then he came to someone in a dream, and he says, those weeks before I passed away was worth the entire life of all of the Talmud. It was, it was totally went quantum, okay? So just to, you know, they're probably going to come after me after this <laughs> We're going to have several groups coming after me, okay? It's okay, man. Echad um, Haya Avraham. Okay? So anyways, this is his text. So those are the five topics, the five questions, or the five, let's say, we'll call it the Mechitzos of Barzel, the five iron curtains, which usually will detract somebody. They're much less now, I feel, than in my days. But then again, in the yeshiva world, it's probably the same. I'm letting you know. In the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the religious world, that it's probably these still all hold up. Only in the secular world are people are very intrigued and interested about it, right? How interesting how things develop. So just once again to go over those five, okay? One was, what do I need to know how many angels there are in heaven? Two was, um, you have to have your belly full of uh, all of the, the Talmud and the codifiers. Three was, my brain's going to turn to mush. Four was, um, <clears throat> it's only for the holy of holy people. And five, we look at what the general populace is doing, and nobody's really into it, so therefore it must be not worth anything. Mm -hmm. Okay? So now, of course, what he does, any Jewish person does, when you have a question, you always answer with another question. Okay? That's the trick always. You have to always know this. 
Anytime anybody asks you a question, you answer with a question. That's always, okay? That's the deflect principle, okay? You just got to get to the root of the matter, okay? Always. Or the classic Jewish answer of any other question is, it depends. There's two rules, golden rules I just gave you now, okay? So we'll put them in your ask pocket. You, any more questions. you can ask me questions, but they probably will be other questions. Well, what are the two rules? When you're asked a question, you either answer with another question or you say, it depends. Two words, the magic words, it depends. <laughs> Okay? Okay, number two. I think that's where you guys are, right? Mm -hmm. 98. However, if we consider only one very famous question, I am sure that all these questions and doubts will vanish over the horizon and disappear as if they had never been. The burning question which is asked of all the inhabitants of the world is... What is the point of our lives? Let me just get that in Hebrew. Okay? Ba'ayinu ha'shela Right? Ha'nish'elus mikol v'nei yared Shehi ma'u ha'tam b'chayenu What is the reason for our living? You know, that's it. Kulamar has to say, he's going to elaborate this, what is the point of our lives, or what is the reason for our living? Why do we live these number of years which cost us so dearly? We go through so much pain and suffering in order to complete them till their end. Who can really say that he enjoys life? Or even more pointedly, is there anyone who benefits from my life? The truth is that the philosophers have left off pondering this question, and it is certainly the case in our generation. No one even wants to consider it. When you do look at the world in general, it could be that maybe your life, Baruch Hashem, and you always have to say Baruch Hashem. And we always have to appreciate what we do have. But if you look at the world in general, there's so much suffering in the world. There's so many people who are suffering from everything from A to Z, okay? If it's not a physical ailment, it's loneliness, or it's this, or it's that, it's brokenness. So many broken people are in the world, no matter where you go. And it's like, okay, God, he created the world, and he created man, and he put us in here, and like, what is the point of all of this? And you know, cause, and we all have ups and downs in our lives. What is the point? So that's the big philosophical question. Okay, that still cannot be answered. And of course, we have discussed this already even several times. And I've probably told you what he says that we're going to discover now. Okay? Nevertheless, the essence of this question still stands in all its force and bitterness. Sometimes it comes upon us unawares and bores into our brains, casting us down to the very dust until we hit upon the well-known strategy of allowing ourselves to be swept up thoughtlessly into the stream of life, just as we did yesterday. In other words, people just go on about their lives and not really thinking about it. Ainan, yeah, we got it, suffering, yeah, move on. And they don't really dig into what's the purpose of our existence. To really, really dig and constantly contemplate. Not just for us, but for all of humanity. So... Most people just choose to ignore it and just keep going, right? But if you really get to the bottom of this and it's clear clarity, and he is the most clear that I've seen, then we'll see it. Now, this is a great way that he takes it off to. This is so great. Achain, lepitron chidat stuma hazu. To answer this closed riddle, okay? Dibir hakasuv. There's a verse in Tehillim. Lamed Dalid Ted, I think it is, 34.9, right? 34.9. Tamu uru ki tov Hashem. Actually, we say it on Shabbat in the, in the song hymns of praise. Tamu uru ki tov Hashem ki makayme, so he says, really it translates to taste and see that God is good. King David says this, taste and see that God is good. Those who establish the Torah and the mitzvahs according to their law, these are the ones who taste the good life. The tam hachayim. Okay? 
Haroim Ma'idim, they see and they give testimony, Kitov Hashem. These are the ones who give testimony that God is good. So it's an interesting impact of what he says here. Taste and see that God is good, and his answer is, the, 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 the commentary is, those who fulfill the Torah and the mitzvahs according to their law, those are the ones who can actually give clear testimony that God is good. Okay, we might be able to say God is good. That's lip service. We try to say it like a parrot. We spit it out. And we try to deepen it. But to come from a real testimony, like I see that God is good, right? You know, like once came to the Rambam, after the Rambam wrote his... Um, what do you call it again? Oh, the Mishnah you. Torah, thank you. We'll just say the Mishnah Torah. His big work. Because he didn't bring sources, you know, in the Mishnah Torah. He didn't bring the sources of all of the halachas that he was bringing. The entire community was incensed about that. Who are you? Right? Mr. Doctor. Right? They came from Brooklyn. No, they didn't. <laughs> but they had to come and investigate the Rambam to see if he was really the scholarly person according to this work, and why didn't he put that? So, of course, he knew these guys were coming to check him out. And this guy, he, the Rambam, he spins circles about everybody. So he gave him the, you know, the meat with the milk, but there was almond milk. <laughs> and they're, like, freaked out on the table. Right? It's almond milk, baby. You can drink that. I want you to drink that. You have to drink. <laughs> They're like, what is it? and he goes, you know, I don't believe in God. He says that right to them. He says, right, I don't believe in God. And they're like, freaking out. He says, I know there's God. Okay? So to come with a belief and a no is much deeper. Okay? The idea here is to come with that knowledge. Okay? So come and see, and we're going to investigate this. This is the, the whole point of this text here. Those who fulfill the Torah and the mitzvot in the correct way are those who taste the true taste of life. They see and bear witness to the fact that God is good. The sages have taught us that God created the worlds in order to benefit his creatures, as we all know that. Judaism 101, and I, all of my students are able, to, are able to really spit it out. Why did God make a creation in order to, two words, I'm deflated. Pleasure. Bestow pleasure. Got it. Bestow pleasure to another. What's the purpose of creation? Bestow pleasure. That's what God's will was. His soul will. Bestow pleasure. It is in the nay, it is, that when they see, see, this is what got everybody in the Madonna people. Mm -hmm. When they explain this from Ashlag, just a little side note, this is why they're so great in Beverly Hills. Right? Like one of the biggest first places. I think there was also New York and, and Los Angeles. When they tell people God made a creation in order to bestow pleasure to another. So they didn't explain the pleasure. People just thought, oh, that sounds good to me. <laughs> right? right? So that's what, it, it's a seller. You have to admit, a hot, hot selling item. Okay? To explain creation like that. It's a good one, and it's true. It is in the nature of the good to do good, because if God is good, it is in the nature of God, who is good, to do good. Makes total sense. But it is certainly the case that someone who has not yet tasted the life of fulfillment in Torah mitzvahs can neither understand nor experience that God is good in the way that the sages taught that God's whole intention in creating man was only to give benefit to all. It's kind of an interesting statement that he says here, okay? Someone who has not yet tasted the life of fulfillment in Torah and Mitzvah could neither understand nor experience that God is good in the way that the sages have taught that God's whole intention in creating man was only to give benefit to all. So we'll explain, we'll get into that whole idea. Therefore, the best recommendation for such a person is to begin the practice of Torah and mitzvah in the correct way. You see, the Torah is not a religion. I'm sorry to say that, to pop your bubble. Okay? It's a technology. It's a technology of the soul. When you follow the technology in the instruction manual and you align yourself 
with the spheres and the spherot, then you are in alignment, then you're plugged in to the infinite source. If you fall out of that alignment, so then it becomes a rocky road. Okay? It's quite simple. There are principles that exist in the universe that God set up, and our whole goal is to align ourselves with those principles. The greatest place I saw that actually is Stephen Covey's book. I think that I don't know if it was The Seven Habits or it's the second one he did by um, the, by um, the clock one. I forgot what that's called. Priority First Things First. That was it's called. He brings this great story, it's so powerful, it's a real true story. Uh, the the navy was doing maneuvers out there some some place you know when they were they've got battleships out there and submarines and they're doing maneuvers they got to do war games you got to practice practice battle so here's a battleship you know out there in the sea in the night and now the guy picks up on the radar he says sure there's an unmarked ship who's not supposed to be there and that we're on a direct collision course with oh. so the captain of that battleship says, tell that, signal to that ship that they have to move, what, 10 degrees starboard, I, that's one of those, what a language, you know, I don't know the language, but whatever, move. So they get a signal back, I'm sure you've heard this before, they get a signal back, you move, 10 <coughs> degrees starboard. So the captain's like, kind of like, poor, <laughs> tell him to move, tell him again, tell him to move 10 degrees because we're on a collision course. So they get a signal back, you move 10 degrees. So the guy, the captain, is incensed, and he signals to them, sends a message, I'm a battleship. You better move 10 degrees. And the answer was, I'm a lighthouse. You better move 10 degrees. Okay? So, <laughs> you know, you think you're big, big, you're all powerful, and you could just go wherever you want. But if you go ahead and hit against the principles, which are like the rocks of the lighthouse, you're going to get smashed. If you're in alignment, it's smooth sailing. You can taste that God is good. But if you fall out of alignment, and then you're in the path of the meteor shower, or the rocks of the lighthouse, it's going to get rocky. Okay? So, you know, there's going to get bumps. Okay? You're either in the wormhole, or you're out of the wormhole. Whatever you want to call it, whatever imagery you want to give yourself. It's in a technology of the soul. That's what the Torah is. How to connect to infinity. We are all stood at Mount Sinai, 2.5 million people. There was a revelation at Mount Sinai. God gave the instructions how to connect to infinity. That's what the Torah is about. Because really, if we don't talk about it, what is the ultimate pleasure that God wants to give? It's not physical pleasures like what they think in, uh, in Beverly Hills. Right? It's all sex, drugs, and rock and roll, or whatever, bagels, or whatever. Okay. <laughs> and bagels. And, a, and an occasional bagel. They don't eat bagels, because they're like orthorexic. They eat, uh, what are those little sandwiches that they make? What, I forgot those little sandwiches. They have names for they those little burgers. An, an amuse bouche? I don't know. <laughs> whatever. Bagels. Okay, we got big names. Sliders. Sliders. Sliders! I'm like, what the heck is a slider? Oh, it's a mini hamburger. Oh, it's a hamburger. It's a small hamburger. No, it's a slider. Get it right. Oh, and then there's sushi. Okay. Oh, does that mean in heaven we get to eat all the sushi we want? Okay. So, no. What is the pleasure that God wants to bestow? Of course, it's not going to be a limited physical pleasure. It's going to be a spiritual pleasure. Because spirituality exists forever. It's eternal. Right? And of course, what is the essence of that spiritual pleasure, which we've all said this before many times? What is the essence that God wants to give him that pleasure? Himself! Because he is the source of all the pleasures. He's the source of that beautiful, delicious cup of coffee that you had. He's the source of that chocolate. He's the source of everything. And the sushi and the sliders and the uh, ganache or whatever. Okay? <laughs> He's the source of every single pleasure. And he wants to give... So in other words, God basically wants to give himself. Our direction is... We have to connect to him. He's the source of all the pleasures. So when the instruction manual was given at Mount Sinai, how to connect to infinity. That's the entire Torah on one foot. Okay? So the idea here is it's an alignment principle. The Judaism is not a religion. It's a technology. Okay? All right, going on.
Oh, I'm not even sure where I am. Okay? <laughs> that one line I said there. It is in the, I'm, I'm on the page uh, 99 there. One, two, yeah, three, yeah. four. We're almost to this line right here. That way down there? Yeah. Okay. No. Thank you. This is what the Torah says. This is what the Torah itself says. See, I have set before you this day life and good or death and evil. Before the Torah was given, there was no choice. Okay? It was only one remedy to get out of the mockery of, of suffering. Right? It was either, you know, it was, it was trial and error. Fall and get up. If you can. Okay? Trial and error. In other words, looking out, going around in the dark. Trying to get out of the maze in the dark. You know, the, the maze that they make with the, with the, you know, I think of The Shining. I'm sorry, I might date myself. Here's you know, where the guy was in the maze, here's <laughs> Shani, and he died in the maze. Anyway, the crazy guy. Anyways, Jack Nicholson. Okay, it's all coming back to me. Okay? But uh, we're in a maze, a garden maze. Can't see. Can't see. Garden maze. So in the garden maze, the only way to get out of the maze was to just keep going till you find a way. Okay? So once the Torah came, right, only death and evil were present. Dark world, dark, dark. This fits in with the, with the remark of the sages that wicked people with their lifetimes are called dead because their death is better than their lives. It's kind of a wild statement. It is known there in the sages, right? Roshayim b'chayehem nikru'u mesim. The wicked people, while they're alive, are called dead because there's no real life inside of them. They might smile, they might talk, they might make a lot of money. But inside, there's really not much life, okay? So we have to understand and we have to re-ask the question, what is life, okay? So they are called death. So this was like pre-Sinai. The pain and suffering that they undergo just in order to survive cost them dearly in comparison with the little amount of pleasure they receive in such a life. However, we have, not, we have now been privileged to receive Torah and mitzvot through, the, through whose fulfillment we can merit true and happy lives which give joy to others and to ourselves according to the true sense of scripture, taste and see that God is good. Therefore, the, the, the verse says, See, I have set before you this day life and good. Meaning when God gave us the Torah, here's the modern remedy, I've, the modern cure. It's only 3,000 years ago. But it's the modern cure is Torah. Okay? Which you did not have at all in the world before the giving of the Torah. The scripture goes on to conclude, and thus choose life in order that you and your offspring will live. So before the Torah, it was, you see, there's really only two kinds of wisdom in the world. Trial and error, or wisdom. What is wisdom? What you get from others in order to navigate through life. So you don't fall, okay? And so the garden maze is a great parable. If you, you know, the garden maze, they have these times, if you go out to those garden mazes, they have people on posts, right? What do you call them? Stands. They're higher up. And so if you get stuck, you go, hey, can you get me out of here? I've been thirsty. I've been wandering around here for hours. I'm about dehydrated. So they'll say, okay, go left, go right, go left, and then you're out, right? If somebody's up telling you where to go, then you get out. The Torah is exactly that direction. The Torah is that wisdom that teaches you how to navigate through life. Watch out for the left. There's a big ditch there with spikes coming out of it, poisonous spikes, <laughs> just to get a little, right, embellishment. Don't go right, because if you turn there, there's, a, there's wild animals. Don't, you know, you can make it, you can embellish it, okay? Serious dangers <laughs> in the world. So the Torah is the modern cure, which gets us out. It helps us to navigate. So therefore, we can, be, we can effectively acquire the idea that he says, taste and see that God is good, okay? Because it's helping us to, to connect, okay? The language here seems redundant. Obviously, if you choose life, you will live. Don't, if you look at the verse itself, right? What does the verse say? Right? Let me look at the verse here in Hebrew, okay? 
Roy nasati lifanecha hayom es a chayim ves a tov es a mavis ves a ra, and then it says ubechart to bechayim. So it says, see, I have placed before you today the life and the and the good and the death and the evil. Now choose life. It's like duh, okay, but it's still kind of redundant. If you're placing before the person the life and the good and then the death and the evil, why do you have to say and now choose life? I mean, yeah, okay. Why would a person know? No, I'll take the death path. Okay? How are we doing in time? Okay, we're good. Okay? So, the language here seems redundant. Obviously, if you choose life, you will live. What the scripture here is actually referring to is a life, is living a life of consciousness through the fulfillment of Torah and mitzvot. This is true life as contrasted to living without Torah and mitzvot. Such a life is more difficult than death. Thus the sages have said, the Rashaim nikru'u meisim b'chayechem. B'chayechem nikru'u meisim. Wicked people within their lifetimes are called dead. You know, sometimes you can have you can try to be, I've been in parties and trying to be with the most successful of people who are so distant from Torah and Mitzvahs and it's very hard to have a conversation with them. I'm just me personally, okay? Because there's not much to talk about with them. They're basically into their thing and growth, well, if, it's, if it doesn't translate into financial growth only, you know, they're not much into anything else, really. So it's very hard to go ahead and try to advance or, or tickle them, tickle their brains a little bit. Yes. Okay. So would another way of looking at the dead are those that are asleep in the dust, that they're still sleeping? They're no, those who usually, when we refer simply to those who are sleeping in the dust, refer to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When we say it in the liturgy, in the prayer, the first prayer, second prayer, sorry, of uh, the Shimon yeah, Esrei, of the silent prayer, the Amidah. You could say sleeping in the dust, though. I mean, listen, you can give that perush because, listen, they have yet to be awakened. Okay? So they're, like, basically, they're in, on the blue pill massively. So strict blue pill diet. You follow what I'm saying? Strict yeah. blue pill. They wake up, and it's just the same day. Right? Or it's just... What does it mean? I, okay, I, so... I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by blue pill. Blue pill, which means, like, they're in a hypnotic state, a certain type of hypnotic state, in which their lives are just basically pretty mundane and it goes through their daily experience in terms of their physical activities and they don't consider, they don't contemplate the soul and they don't contemplate the afterlife and they don't contemplate that there's a bigger thing going on and there's bigger things to do in this world. They, don't, they definitely don't contemplate morality, right, of, of any kind. You're referencing okay? the movie The Matrix? Yes. For those who understood, who saw the movie The Matrix, the blue pill basically just keeps you in that hypnotic state where you're just going through life to the day-to-day -day experiences and, you know, not really trying to, like, affect or develop. It's the most or, boring movie I've ever I'm seen. I'm so <laughs> glad that you found that. My mom, you would agree. She's like, I can't, I can't. You know, as soon as, like, she, because, you know, whatever. It's, it's okay. It's good. It's good. I'm glad, okay? <laughs> Maybe, you'll, well, you know, whatever. The idea here is some people are just not ready to, to, be, awakened, to be awakened up, Neo. Okay? So the idea here is there's going to be some people who are, you call it sleeping in the dust. Hey, call it the wicked are dead while they're alive because there's no life force in them. There's no juice. There's no juice. Okay? They might be juiced to make money. They might be juiced to, to pursue physical things or physical pleasures. That's not called the real juice. There's a real juice to taste, okay? The real punch. Kool-Aid, yeah! Yes, I drank the Kool-Aid, and I went back for more, okay? Can, I'm okay with that. When Scripture says, in order that you and your offspring should live, that's the rest of the verse that says, right? The rest of the verse says, I have, see, I have placed before you this day life and good, Right? And then it says, in order that, and just therefore choose good, in order that you and your offspring should live. It implies that, that a life without Torah not only gives no pleasure to oneself, but cannot benefit others either. Kind of interesting when you think about it. Most specifically a person's family. 
A person cannot even have pleasure from his or her own children since their lives are also harder than death. What sort of inheritance is that to pass on to them? You might have uh, ideas in passing through your mind where this could be true, where people who are successful, quote-unquote successful people, and their lives are basically a shambles through either divorce cases, married eight times, <laughs> their kids don't want to speak to them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is it fully functioning? Really, there's no really fully functioning family in this planet, right? There are a few, I would think, that I've seen in the Torah world, okay, where they're fully functioning. That means a happy, dynamic, loving, bonding relationships through the, the husband and wife and the children, too. Boy, what a bargain, okay? Ding, 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 okay? But if you can find anywhere else in the world... I'm happy to hear it, okay? Where people are not engaged in Torah mitzvahs or spirituality of any kind. If you're engaged in spirituality, it could be a good life. Mm -hmm. Could be. Has to be some aspect of spirituality involved in it, okay? However, one who lives in the consciousness of Torah and mitzvot not only enjoys his or her own life, but he or she is happy to give birth to children to whom they bequeath this good life. And this is the meaning of, in order that you and your seed should live. In other words, a person then has additional joy in the life of his or her own children, and he or she was a prime cause of them. In order to bequeath the principles of the Torah, the morality of the Torah and all of its principles is a dynamic thing. The bottom line is, taste and see that God is good. Okay? In other words, just kind of so hard for me to tell this, to say this over, and maybe this is a little bit over the top, okay? You know, until you've tasted it, you haven't tasted it. So it's kind of a challenge to all of you, and I understand it might be a little bit pushy, but that's what he does. That's not me, it's the text, okay? Now, of course, everybody has to go in increments and to try to taste the Torah and the observance of the Torah is not an all-or-nothing thing, and it does work in increments. Like Rabbi Wolby says, there's two types of Jews, growing or non-growing, okay? And that's really a great dynamic. When you split the world like that, it helps so much, okay? So that then you can, when you engage people at a party or a social event, are you growing? And you'll see what the answer is. Oh, 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 I got better on my golf swing. Okay, so you're not growing. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> let's move on. Okay, so, um, so the idea here is growing or not growing. You're either going to be motivated to grow, which means learn Torah. Here, coming here, all of you, is a fantastic move. Because this is going to introduce to you the principles of the Torah in the most inner way. And when you have that in the most inner way, then a whole life opens up for you. Okay? I danced home when I bought this book. I danced. Okay? I was like not touching the floor. I was so happy. Because it answered basic questions like this. Taste and see that God is good. You got to taste it. The proof of the pudding is the pudding, like my Rosh Hashiva Zichron Livracha said. Okay? Taste, you got to, the put, taste, taste of the pudding is the pudding itself, okay? And Baruch Hashem, we have Rabbi Ashlag to go ahead and show us the way, okay? Let's just do a little bit more. One more little paragraph here. I don't think we'll finish four, but we'll start it. Through what we have said, you can now understand the words of the sages when they explain the meaning of the scripture, of the verse, and thus choose life. Rashi's commentary on this verse is as follows. We're just going to like start, it, start here the question. This is what Rashi says. I teach you that you should choose the portion of life. This is like the case of a man saying to his son, choose the best portion of my inheritance. But then the man himself stands over the son, pointing the finger to the best parts of his inheritance, saying this is the best part. Okay? This is the part you should choose. Right? So that's an interesting kind of metaphor. In other words, we're asked the question is, why is it a double language, right? I put before you life and good and death and evil. Now choose life. So the, the imagery is a father telling his son this, this, take this, take this. Obviously, you get a question of what? That it was confusing before, right? What's going on? Why does the father have to stand over his son and say, this is it. This is what you got to take. Why? 
Okay? And this is the part that you should choose. Concerning this, the psalmist says, or King David and Melech says, God is the portion of my inheritance and cup. Meaning you support my lot. In other words, you have placed my hands on the best part of the inheritance, saying, take this part for yourself. And now he's going to introduce the question. All this seems odd. On the one hand, the verse says, choose life, which surely means that a person should choose for himself or herself. You had to choose for yourself. But now the sages are saying that God himself stands over the, over the very best part in which they, the case. There seems to be no free choice here. Not only that, but they go on to say that God himself places the person's hand on the good portion. And this is all very surprising because if this is the case, where is your free choice? Because God's telling you, choose life or death, baby. This, this. And he's taking your face and he's shoving it in there. Okay. Right? <laughs> Like it's the onion bagel. The on, go for the onion bagel, right? So the <laughs> the biali. So you shove yeah. your face in the biali. So obviously, like, where's the choice? <laughs> okay, Dan. Okay, I got it. Okay. So <laughs> the the idea here is, well, where's the free choice? If God's telling you choose life or death, and then He's telling you, and He's like almost attaching to you, this. Wow. It begs the question. First of all, where's the free will? Okay. You it's almost as if it's forced. It. Yeah, and the, real, and the reality is it's not an easy choice because the side of death and evil has a lot of enticements, okay? It's very enticing, and we're born in it, okay? We're born with a huge influence to, to, to where it's not such a simple choice, okay? But look at how much God is directing us. Baruch Hashem, we have the modern cure, Torah. It is the modern cure that is going to get us out of the pain and suffering. And Baruch Hashem, we have Rabbi Ashlag, who's going to show us the way in order for all of us to be ambassadors. Because obviously, when people get, when you grasp the principles that he's bringing and share this with others, it becomes a different life. Okay? We'll stop here. There was a guy on the shift that said, I've had six.